Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. Last month at the Tesla Semi event, Tesla unveiled immersion cooling technology that can provide more than one megawatt of DC charging power. However, they left a lot to the imagination, such as whether the Semi and Cybertruck will use the same charger and whether all Tesla vehicles will have access to megawatt charging power. Today I'll lay out the case for why I think Tesla will be producing both a multi-megawatt megacharger for the Semi as well as a single megawatt V4 supercharger for the Cybertruck that will also be accessible by all the other vehicles in Tesla's lineup. Along the way, I'll walk you through the specs and schematics for Tesla's 1000 volt charging standard, the limiting factors for charging speed, and why I think the V3 supercharger network might also get a performance boost. As usual, I'll provide information and context so you can form your own view. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. Let's start with what supercharging is and a brief history of Tesla's supercharger technology. With a typical electric vehicle, despite having one charge port, many people don't realize there are actually two different ways that the vehicle charges. One involves alternating current, or AC power, and the other uses direct current, or DC power. Let's start with AC power. Electric vehicles contain an onboard charger, which allows them to charge at nearly any AC connection, whether that's at home or public charging stations that supply AC power. When a vehicle charges using AC power, the onboard charger converts the AC power from the grid to DC power that can be used by the vehicle battery. Onboard charging equipment is expensive and heavy, so it's usually designed to meet the minimum daily needs of most people. Therefore, it has limited capacity. In the case of Tesla, that's 11.5 kilowatts, which is enough power to fully charge the vehicle overnight or to top it up in a few hours. However, when it comes time for fast charging in an hour or less, a DC fast charger is required. DC fast chargers have heavy-duty power electronics that can deliver high-voltage, high-amp DC power to the vehicle. The DC fast charger bypasses the onboard charger and mainlines the power directly into the battery pack. In the case of Tesla, the DC fast charger is called the supercharger. This brings us to the history and technical progression of the Tesla supercharger. Tesla launched their first supercharger in 2012 that had a power output of 90 kilowatts. Notice that the cable was short and thick. A longer and thinner cable would have meant greater resistance and therefore heat. With that said, it was probably overkill, and I'm guessing the engineers were erring on the side of caution for their first version. Version 2 launched the next year, with a power output of 120 kilowatts. The cable was longer, but still thick, stiff, and difficult to manage. Version 3 launched in 2019 and saw a number of innovations. First, Tesla made the charging cable thinner. Although this meant greater heat generation, Tesla solved that problem by adding a liquid coolant loop to the cable for thermal management. The result was a lighter weight, more flexible cable that was easier to manage. Second, the new charging cable also allowed Tesla to increase the power output of the V3 supercharger to 250 kilowatts. Interestingly, at the same time that Tesla released the V3 supercharger, they also unlocked higher charging speeds at V2 superchargers. This allowed all V2 superchargers in the network to increase their power output from 120 kilowatts to 145 kilowatts. With an understanding of DC fast chargers and the history of the supercharger out of the way, let's get into the reasons why my view is that the mega charger used for the semi and the V4 supercharger for Tesla passenger vehicles are separate products. First, we have photos and video of the mega chargers that were installed for Frito Lay. The plug for the charger itself is different than the plug for Tesla vehicles. Also, notice the thickness of the charging cable. It's thicker than a Tesla V3 cable, which would be expected for an industrial application like charging semis. Which brings us to my second point. To achieve the 70% charge in 30 minutes that Tesla's advertising, the mega charger for the semi will need to provide far more than one megawatt of power. A 70% charge for the semi in 30 minutes is an average power output of 1.2 megawatts. However, the peak charge rate at the beginning of the charge process may need to be over 2 megawatts. 
For example, the long-range Tesla Model 3 has an 82 kilowatt hour battery pack which can accept 250 kilowatts on a V3 supercharger and charges to almost 80% in 30 minutes. That is, it can accept a power input that's three times the pack size. If the same were true of the Semi, with roughly a 900 kilowatt hour pack, it would require 2.7 megawatts of power. Of course, the semi charges from 70% in 30 minutes rather than 80%, so it would be more like roughly 2.3 megawatts, but that's still over double what Tesla showed in their presentation. The second reason why I think the Mega Charger and V4 Supercharger are separate products is that last month, Tesla released documentation that provides details on how to build chargers that are compatible with Tesla's supercharger network. They're calling the technical specs and schematics for their superchargers the North American Charging Standard, or NACS. Tesla also provided CAD files and thanks to Chunk Ahoy on Twitter for rendering them. The CAD files provided plugs and inlets for both 500 volt and 1000 volt applications. The 500 volt plug and inlet were used in V1 to V3 superchargers. Given that Tesla said V4 superchargers will use a 1000 volt architecture, the 1000 volt plug and inlet are likely what V4 superchargers will use. With regards to backwards compatibility, both plugs are compatible with both inlets, but the 1000 volt inlet and plug pairing is the only way to draw 1000 volt power. On that note, for those that are wondering, yes, the electronics will be backwards compatible as well. Superchargers are designed to provide the maximum power that the pack can handle, and the electronics between the supercharger and pack take care of the rest to protect the battery pack. Wattage is, of course, volts times amps, and so far we've just covered volts. What about amps? If we dig into the documentation, we can see that at the time it was written, the North American charging standard is good for more than 900 amps of continuous load. 1000 volts times 900 amps means a minimum of 900 kilowatts, or 0.9 megawatts. So assuming further optimization and taking into account potentially higher power for intermittent loads rather than continuous loads, the V4 supercharger looks like it's well equipped to hit over a megawatt of power output. Again, however, I expect the V4 supercharger won't be capable of the multi-megawatt power output that the semi would require to hit a 70% state of charge in 30 minutes. That will require a specialized mega charger. While we're on the topic, some people have claimed that the charging plug used at Frito-Lay isn't the final version of the Mega Charger, and that Tesla will swap the plugs out for a charger that looks like a typical supercharger plug. That doesn't make sense to me. I don't think Tesla would have started customer deliveries with an ad hoc charging receptacle on the Semi, and an ad hoc plug on their Mega Charger. It makes more sense to me that due to a battery pack that's probably 5 times larger than what the Cybertruck will have and 11 times larger than a Model 3 or Model Y battery, the Semi will require an industrial solution that's several times more powerful. For example, Charin is developing a 3.75 megawatt Semi charger that they intend on releasing in 2024. With that in mind, I'm expecting 2 to 3 megawatts minimum from the Tesla Mega Charger, not a measly 1 megawatt hour. The counter argument to that would be that in the Tesla Semi presentation, Elon and Dan seem to be referring to the Mega Charger and V4 Supercharger interchangeably. That might mean they're one and the same. However, in my experience, when Tesla runs live events, they don't rehearse them and they're very much off the cuff. Sometimes that leads to crossed wires and a lack of clarity. My view is that the lack of clarity around the V4 Supercharger and Mega Charger are just another example of that. I think that both do use the immersion cooling technology and a V4 cable, but the plugs are different and the semi requires a much thicker cable. As always, what I'm sharing here is my best interpretation of the information available, so I'm definitely open to alternative viewpoints. Let me know in the comments below whether you think the Mega Charger and V4 Supercharger are separate technologies. With the differentiation between the Mega Charger and V4 Supercharger out of the way, let's dig into the megawatt charge slide that Tesla showed at the Semi event. They showed a graph comparing the amps per square millimeter, or ampacity, of the V2, 3, and 4 supercharger cables, V4 being the technology unveiled at the Semi event. The V4 cable is around 35 amps per square millimeter, whereas the V3 cable was around 14, and the V2 cable was around 4. But when Tesla says amps per square millimeter, are they referring to just the cross-section of the conductive portion of the cable, or the cross-section of the entire cable? To me it seems clear that they're referring to the entire cable, 
For example, the V2 cable was thick and it was originally capable of 120 kilowatts of output. The V3 cable was thin, but because it was water cooled was capable of 250 kilowatts of output. That is, the V3 cable was both thinner and could supply double the power, so it needed an amp rating that was more than double. And that's exactly what we see. The V3 cable has an amp rating that's 3.5 times higher than the V2 cable. If my assumption about ampacity for cable cross-section is correct, let's look at the implications. The ampacity graph shows that the V4 cable has 2.5 times the ampacity of the V3 cable. The V3 cable had a power output of 250 kilowatts. So if we assume that the new V4 cable has the same diameter, that would mean V4 has power output of 625 kilowatts at the same voltage. However, if we factor in that Tesla has plans to upgrade from 500 volts to 1000 volts, that would mean 1.25 megawatts of power. Bear in mind that 1.25 megawatts is an oversimplified back of the napkin calculation. For example, we don't know if the thickness of the V4 cable is actually the same as the V3 cable. The back of the napkin math is just to provide some context on how Tesla may have reached 1 megawatt of power output with a cable that's no thicker than current supercharger cables and why a thicker cable would be required for the megacharger. Will Tesla unleash the full power of the V4 supercharger when it hits supercharging stations next year? We'll discuss that later in the video. First, let's look at the engineering required to achieve five times the power output in the same form factor. Watts, or power, is of course calculated by multiplying volts times amps. Amps create issues by generating heat, and volts create containment issues. Tesla covered the engineering for amps and heat generation in their semi-slide, so let's cover amps first and then I'll cover voltage. In the V3 supercharger, Tesla ran a coolant tube through the charging cable that likely contained a mix of water and antifreeze so that the cable wouldn't freeze up during winter. As you can see, the individual positive and negative wires and the coolant tubes all appear to have sheaths. Those sheaths would have slowed the movement of heat from the wires to the coolant tubes as the wire temperature increased during charging. On the V4 supercharger, the coolant loops would likely carry the coolant from the supercharger to the coolant plug. Then, as the image shows, the coolant would return to the supercharger in the coolant return tubes. Let's zoom in a little closer. Within the coolant return tubes are the bare, uninsulated wires. The bare wires are immersed in liquid coolant and therefore directly in contact with it. The bare wires and coolant are then packaged in two layers of sheathing. Some might argue that what Tesla is showing here is wire surrounded by liquid cooling surrounded by another sheath, but I disagree with that. Tesla states that the conductors themselves are immersed in coolant return tubes. A conductor implies bare wire rather than a wire with sheathing. Regardless, Tesla's immersion cooling is how they solve for the amp side of the power equation. Usually, thicker conductive material is needed to reduce resistance for higher current loads to keep heat generation under control. Not only did Tesla increase the amperage by more than double, they appear to have decreased the conductor thickness, which is a double whammy for heat generation. But that heat generation isn't a problem if the conductors are immersed in a flow of liquid to wick away heat. Conceptually, immersion cooling is straightforward, but implementation would have been a challenge to say the least. Let's take a closer look. First, why would two layers of protective sheath be required? Not only does Tesla have to worry about the typical risks of electrical shorts, that risk is compounded by the liquid in the coolant return tubes that's in direct contact with the bare wire. Second, Tesla said the liquid coolant will be water. I'm assuming they'll need some type of antifreeze in the tubes so they don't freeze in winter. But water and antifreeze means ions, and running electricity through water with ions means electrified water. Wouldn't gases be released when the coolant is exposed to electricity? No, because electrolysis requires current flow between a positive and negative electrode. That can't occur if the positive and negative coolant loops are electrically isolated from each other. This brings up the third challenge with the V4 supercharger, isolation and monitoring, which Tesla brought up at the semi-event. How does Tesla keep the coolant loops electrically isolated? As I showed earlier, there are two coolant loops which are marked in neon green here and two immersion cooling return tubes marked in pink. To isolate the positive and negative, it would simply be a matter of pairing each cooling tube with a coolant return tube. But how would the liquid be transferred between the tubes? Let's take a look at plug schematics from Tesla's North American Charging Standard documentation. 
The 500 volt plug is currently used in V1 to V3 superchargers, and the 1000 volt plug will likely be used in the V4 supercharger. Notice that the collar of the 1000 volt plug is larger and appears to house a complex series of chambers. My speculation is that the chambers will allow the entire head of the plug to be cooled and will also act as a U-turn point where the coolant can be transferred from the coolant tubes to the coolant return tubes. The 500 volt plug has a smaller collar and the schematic doesn't show chambers. That lack of detail could have been an oversight, but my view is that detail wasn't necessary for that schematic. That's because the V3 charging cable uses a simple coolant loop that's isolated from the wires. The coolant just needed to do a U-turn when it got to the plug rather than requiring a transfer from one tube to another. What about electrical isolation on the supercharger end? The coolant would be stripping heat from the bare wires on the return journey and would arrive at the supercharger at a higher temperature than it left. That means there's probably a cooling system in the V4 supercharger. I suspect that's why the V4 superchargers now have a solid core rather than a hollow core like the V3 chargers. When the coolant arrives at the supercharger, the positive and negative coolants will still be electrified. That means they would have to remain electrically isolated and monitored within the supercharger as they're cooled. Furthermore, just as the coolant had to be combined with the bare wires at the plug, it will need to be separated from the bare wires at the supercharger so it can be injected into the coolant tubes to repeat the cycle. Again, all the while maintaining electrical isolation. I have some ideas on how that might be done, but nothing definitive. Everything I've laid out here is of course speculation on my end, but if it's correct, the level of technical expertise on display here is peerless when compared to any other charger on the market. Now that we've covered the technical challenges for the amp side of the power equation, let's cover volts. We know from the Tesla Semi event and Tesla schematics that they're moving to a 1000 volt architecture. But how is the 1000 volt supercharger architecture different from the 500 volt architecture? Let's look at the CAD rendering from Chunk Ahoy to get a better visualization of the two plugs. With the 500 volt plug, there are pathways for electricity to arc from one terminal to another, especially if it was wet. At 500 volts, that may not have been an issue. However, arcing may have been an issue with this plug at 1000 volts. So Tesla lengthened the plug, which provided them with leeway to both add cooling in the collar and also change the shape of the plug tip by adding valleys between the terminals. This may reduce the chances of electrical arcing by forcing those arcs to traverse the valleys between the terminals. Tesla does run checks on their charging plugs at the beginning of the charge cycle to test for shorts, but the shape of the plug will likely improve the performance and reliability. I can't see any other reason for the change in shape. If you have a view, let me know in the comments below. With all the technical review out of the way, what's the use case and impact of the V4 supercharger? To understand that, we need an understanding of the limiting factors for charge speed. As this graph from the Long Range Model 3 shows, there's a charging plateau at 250 kilowatts, which is the power output limit of the V3 supercharger. However, what about the slope? The shape of the slope is determined by many factors, but for the purposes of this video, it's mainly governed by the rate that the anode can store lithium, with cooling being a secondary factor. An oversimplified explanation is that as a battery charges, the graphite on the anode fills with lithium ions. At first, the graphite is empty and can accept lithium ions quickly. Later in the charge cycle, there are fewer empty spaces, so the charge rate has to slow down. If the charge rate isn't reduced, the lithium creates a traffic jam and plates as pure metal at the surface of the graphite, which destroys the battery. If we add silicon to the anode, it does change the dynamic because the lithium alloys with the silicon before entering the graphite. But graphite and lithium plating again soon become the limiting factor after about a 20-30% to 30 state of charge. What all that means is that the charge slope we see here is the maximum charge rate for the chemistry. Notice that the 250 kilowatt plateau overshoots the slope and then falls below it before returning to trend. This raises the question, if Tesla increases the charge power above 250 kilowatts, would it increase the overall charge speed? 
without knowing more about Tesla's charging algorithm, the amount of silicon in the battery cells, and the thermal limits of the cells and battery pack, I can't provide a definitive answer here. I'd speculate that a higher supercharger output of about 300 kilowatts would be near the chemical limits of Tesla's current vehicles at a low state of charge. It would help, but only slightly, and it would be dependent on the vehicle. 2 minutes for a Model 3 or Y, and 8 minutes for a Model S or X. That is, for most Tesla owners, a faster charger will provide benefits, but not drastic benefits for current battery chemistries. So what's the point of a V4 supercharger? It's for vehicles with larger battery packs like the Cybertruck. For a Cybertruck with a hypothetical 170 kilowatt hour battery pack, the V4 supercharger would need to provide over 510 kilowatts of peak power output to keep up with the charging speed of the rest of Tesla's vehicle lineup. However, that assumption is based on vehicles which currently appear to be bottlenecked at 250 kilowatts. For unbottlenecked power, the Cybertruck might be able to briefly handle over 600 kilowatts of supercharger output and possibly up to 700 kilowatts if the Cybertruck has a 200 kilowatt hour battery. With all that in mind, I'm hoping for at least 500 kilowatts from the V4 supercharger so the Cybertruck can at least match the charge speed of the rest of Tesla's vehicle lineup. Although it might be capable of more than a megawatt, there are only two circumstances where I can see that much power being used. First, for the semi. But then, of course, the semi wouldn't be able to charge at the advertised 70% in 30 minutes. Second, if it's connected to a Cybertruck that's capable of an ultra-fast 80% charge in 10 minutes. But Tesla won't develop that technology until sometime after 2025. So if the V4 supercharger has a megawatt of power output, that's likely overkill for the first generation Cybertruck. That much power might be useful for the semi if there's an adapter, but that would be an edge case and it would make more sense for the semi to have its own dedicated chargers. More on that in the next video. Some people might point out that 500 kilowatts conflicts with Elon's comments last year about a 300 kilowatt supercharger upgrade. My view is that just like when the V3 supercharger was launched and we saw a slight bump in performance to the V2 supercharger, Tesla may unlock the V3 supercharger to 300 kilowatts when the V4 supercharger launches. I don't think Elon would have made this announcement on Twitter if he considered it a versional improvement to the supercharger. Instead, he saved the V4 announcement for the semi event, and the V3 improvements would be considered a minor upgrade. In summary, by looking at publicly available photos of the megacharger and Tesla's North American charging standard documentation for superchargers, my view is that Tesla will produce both a megacharger for the semi and a V4 supercharger for passenger vehicles. The megacharger will use a thicker cable to handle the amps required for multi-megawatt loads, and the V4 supercharger will use a thinner, more customer-friendly cable for around one megawatt of load. The megacharger likely needed a different plug design than the V4 plug to deal with the heat from larger amp loads, whereas the V4 plug head had to be backwards compatible with previous versions of the supercharger, while also dealing with both more heat and higher volts. Beyond that, I wouldn't be surprised if the V3 supercharger gets an upgrade to 300 kilowatts or more. Although that would be somewhat beneficial for most of Tesla's vehicle fleet, it would be most beneficial for the Cybertruck, which would suffer slow charge rates on a 250 kilowatt charger and would sponge up every additional kilowatt to accelerate charging speed. As a side note, the short and moderate range versions of the Cybertruck would be fine. It's just the long range version that would suffer at 250 kilowatts. With that said, a megawatt V4 supercharger seems to be far in excess of what's needed for a long range Cybertruck. More than double, in fact. So why build a supercharger so powerful? Future proofing. A megawatt architecture could handle not just large packs, but large packs that ultra fast charge, which aren't expected for several years. If all the information and speculation I've laid out here today is correct, the V4 architecture with immersion cooling is quite a technical achievement and sets Tesla up well for at least the next decade and may even be the last version of the supercharger that's ever needed. You may notice in this video that I somewhat neglected the megacharger. In the next video, I'll focus on the megacharger and the implications of its multi-megawatt power demands.
Before I close things out, I want to say a big thanks to Here We Go Again on Twitter. The discussions we had after the semi event massively upgraded my understanding of superchargers, electric motors, and inverters. That saved me days or weeks of research and a lot of potential errors. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to Jiri Konacek for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.